talk to you today about gatekeepers. Everybody say gatekeepers. Gatekeepers. Help me preach to someone sitting next to you just to get their attention a little bit. Say, are you a gatekeeper? King David said, I would prefer to be a gatekeeper in my father's house than to be celebrated. Some of you don't want to be gatekeepers. You're like, gatekeeper, I studied first degree, second degree. I even have two master's degree or maybe three master's degree. And then I have a PhD and I have another thing on the way that I'm studying. I'm, I have 11, 12 certifications in IT, in medicine, in this, and then you say gatekeeper. Do you know who I am? <laughs> You're a gatekeeper. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. Father, breathe on your word this morning as we look into your word. Please teach us, speak to our hearts. Transform us by the ministry of the word. In Jesus' name. I said to us in previous weeks, I said intercession is not the same. It's not just praying. Intercession is not just praying. It's not just praying for somebody else. I could pray for you and not intercede for you. You remember I said that? I could pray for you, but I'm actually not interceding for you. Not that it is wrong, but intercession is deeper than just praying for somebody. It is becoming part of that person's journey. It is becoming part of that person's burden. You don't even have to know them. You don't even have to, you don't even have to, have to they don't have to be nice to you. But, and that's why I said intercession is a calling. Or let me put it in a better way. It's an assignment that you take on. It says, I will not keep quiet until Jerusalem becomes a praise among the nations. That's an intercession. Somebody has carried a burden. They've carried an, a, a burden. Till so, so, and so happens. You find that a true prophet has to be an intercessor. If somebody comes to you and prophesies to you, something that God has not been speaking to you about, and you're panicking and you're rushing around. Something is wrong with you. You don't know the scriptures. Because somebody who can really prophesy into your life has to be an intercessor. Has to be the kind of person that carries burden. Hello? <laughs> your pastor has to be an intercessor. Because he or she has to carry the burden for your life. No matter how nice you are, no matter how spiritually mature you are, no matter how uh, annoying you are, no matter how blessed you already look, it doesn't matter. The, your leader, somebody who you surrender to in the things of God, must have such a strong burden and passion for your life to see you succeed to the point where we or without your knowledge, they are agonizing in prayer regularly for you. Intercession is not just about pray, it's not just praying. It's deeper than that. And so, I spoke to Ross and I said, we are watchmen. And we saw the example, let me, let me read it to you very quickly, in Isaiah 62, for example, Isaiah 62, verse number 6. It says, Oh Jerusalem, I have posted watchmen on your walls. They will pray day and night. Continually. Take no rest, all you who pray to the Lord. It says they will take positions on the wall. Now, I told you, I've shared this with us before. The wall of Jerusalem is not just a wall like a fence. It's a, it's, you could live in there. There are people who live in the wall. It's big. It's huge. And the king, in the cool of the evening, can go over. There's an area on the wall where they go over and they sit down. And they have meetings, and the big, the big boys of the city or the big boys of the country, they will, you know, they will go there and they would hang out and discuss serious matters. And during times of invasion or war or threats of, of war or things like that, the, the soldiers will be they would double the number or triple the number of soldiers on the wall of the city. There will be people in the watchtower watching kilometers away to see whether there's an invading army coming towards the city. They have a responsibility to watch, to keep watch, to keep watch. To, to watch is different from to keep watch. To watch is for a moment. To keep watch means there's always a watch going on. 
It means that if this person is tired, they, they will replace that person with somebody else. 24-7, somebody is watching to ensure that there's no army evading, coming, you know, to try and invade the, the city. The Bible talks about, about a breach or a, a gap in the wall. It's, that's when, so, you know, maybe for a reason the, the wall is broken or an army has tried to invade and they've blown up part of the wall and there's a big gaping hole on the wall. They will put a soldier there, you know, with his ammunition ready to fire, ready to shoot with his arrows and spears and sword and all whatnot, ready to fight any army because that breach is a place where the enemy can come through. That breach is a place where the enemy can come through. And I was talking to us last week that as a church, the body of Christ in Basingstoke and Prince Embassy in particular, we are watchmen over the town. That every town has a kind of, you know, kind of things, spiritual things that happen around it. Sometimes demonic, sometimes very weird things going off. And you're looking around the town and looking around the community and you're asking yourself, what is going on here? As a gate, I mean, as, as, a, as a watchman who is on the wall, as a watchman who is on the wall of prayer. Now, not just physical, you know, soldiers now, but, you know, taking that as a spiritual connotation, as a watchman, as a Christian who believes in intercession and prayers, you can take a prayer burden for your town. You can pray regularly for Basingstoke and say, Lord, I'm keeping watch over Basingstoke. All this kind of evil, businesses shutting down, kids getting into trouble in school, all kinds of things, evil things, bad things going on in our community. I can take a stand and say, no, no, not anymore. No, not any longer. I can take a stand. I can stand upon my watch in the early hours of the morning, in the cool of the evening, all times of the day. I could raise a prayer. That's the responsibility of the church in Basingstoke. We ought to, out of love, out of passion for our towns and our communities, out of passion for our nation, we ought to take a stand in the place of prayer. And push back the tide of evil. Restore the economic value. Restore the beauty of the nation. Restore the glory of the nation. In the place of prayer. In the place of prayer. That's part of our responsibility as a church. Not just to stand there and condemn the government. Oh, they don't know what they're doing. Oh, these people are messed up. Oh, this and that. We can complain and complain and complain. But Paul says to Timothy, pray for those in authority. He says, intercede for them. He first of all says, pray for them. You know, and then he says, intercede for them so that you will be able to do what? Live a peaceable life. Why does he say pray and then say intercede? Because it's deeper. He's saying to them, don't just pray. Take a burden. Stand on, the, on your watch for them. Because the work they're doing, the burden they're carrying is huge. It's heavy. So that you can live a peaceable life. He says, son of man, Ezekiel 3, 17 to 19. Son of man, Ezekiel 3, 17 to 19. Son of man, I have appointed you as a watchman for Israel. Whenever you receive a message from me, warn people immediately. That's another thing the watchman does, you warn. He says, whenever you receive a message from me, warn people immediately. A friend of mine called me this morning, early hours of this morning. He said, I know Sunday is the wrong time to call you, I'm sorry. But I was just starting the book of Mark and this and that and God was laying this on my heart to share with you. I'm so sorry I'm taking your time, but I just need to share this with you before you go to church today. And I say, oh, thank you so much. I'm so grateful. That confirms what I was already praying about. It says, if I warn the wicked, verse number 18, if I warn the wicked, saying you are under the penalty of death, but you fail to deliver the warning, they will die in their sins, and I will hold you responsible for their deaths. If you warn them, and they refuse to repent, and keep on sinning, they will die in their sins, but you will have saved yourself because you obeyed me. A watchman, you know, a watchman obeys God. A watchman listens for the heart of God. A watchman listens for the heart of God. What makes God happy? What makes God happy? A watchman is somebody who listens out for the intents and the plan and the purposes of God. A watchman is somebody who goes out there and declares the truth, irrespective of what people will feel, irrespective of what people might say. A watchman is somebody who delivers the truth in love. You cannot do this ministry. You cannot serve this purpose without love in your heart. You have to love the people. You have to sacrifice yourself sometimes. Imagine that there's a breach in the wall and the soldier is standing there and trying to fight. He knows very well that that's a place of compromise. That, that, that's a place of, or that's a defect in the, in the system. You know, the Bible says, you know, it's, if, if there's a breach, a serpent will strike. That's what the Bible says in Nahum. If you have a breach, a serpent will constrict. 
In other words, if there's a gaping hole, something can creep in. And so if your responsibility as a soldier is to defend that spot, you know that you are putting your life at risk. So intercession is risky. So why, you, why, why would you be an intercessor without, pray, without prayer? Why would you be a Christian without praying? Because when you say you're a Christian, you're saying to Satan, I've decamped from your side. I've decamped from your will. I'm now doing the will of God. I'm now doing the bidding of God. And that will be challenged. Every sermon you hear in church is challenged. Every sermon you preach is challenged. Everything you speak about is challenged because the devil wants to prove that there is no God. But you are out there. You have a conviction in your heart that there is God. The Bible says only a fool says in his heart that there is no God. And so you've received the wisdom of God. You've been able to conceive and understand and accept and know beyond reasonable doubt that there is God. You want to go out there and tell people there are institutions, structures in place to ensure that you cannot do that. So you have to spend time in prayer. You have to spend time in prayer. But I want, I want to narrow down a little bit deeper. I want to go down deeper into this ministry of intercession. And I want to tell you about gatekeepers. Now, gatekeeping is different from watching the wall. You see, the wall in, in those days in Israel, the wall is huge, as I said to you. People could even live in there. They do meetings over there. The big boys and the big the chiefs and the captains, they, 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 they do their, you know, they, they have a good time. They, you know, they, they have a good time. But, but when we talk about the gate, the gate is more specific. The gate is more towards, it's more, it's, more, it's more about your home. It's more about your house. It's more about a household. It's more about a, an immediate environment. This is not just about the entire city. This is about your own place. This is about your family. This is about your friends. In fact, this is about you, actually. This is about you because you ought to be the gatekeeper of your own mind. You, know, you, ought, you ought to protect yourself from all the junk and garbage that is around in the world today. You have a responsibility to preserve your truth. You have a responsibility to preserve the, the rich word of God that is in you. Because when you allow the things that are contaminants to, uh, to, to, to come into your mind, then they mess you up and mess up your faith. And when troubles of life come, before you know it, you fall over because your faith is being messed up by other things in the world. So in a way, you look at yourself as a gatekeeper. You're a gatekeeper. You're a gatekeeper. You're responsible for the things that go that you allow in. Build a very strong gate. Build a very strong wall and keep watch over your soul. Keep watch. Keep watch. Lest you become deceived. Lest, you know, heresy catches up on you. Lest you get distracted in your journey. I want to show you a scripture in the book of 1 Chronicles chapter 9. 1 Chronicles chapter 9 is a very, very uh, important scripture in the Bible. Chronicles generally is a record of the kings. Chronicles is the record of the, of, you know, the, the account of what's going on during the reign of a particular king. They'll keep those records and write them, you know. And I believe a lot of, you know, governments and kingdoms, um, they, I'm sure they still do that today. And this is an account of the Levites and the leaders of Israel as they returned from exile. After the country had been invaded and then they were released to go back and all the Levites and all the leaders that came back, all right? And he talked about, the, the, you know, we know about the Levitical priesthood, don't we? The Levites are this, you know, the descendants of Levi. Not Levites as in Levi Strauss cousins, but, you know, the, the, the descendants of Levi, you know, a tribe in Israel. And you know, we know that they, they're the ones, you know, like sons of Korah, for example, they're Levites. You know, the, 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 the three children of Jeshabed, Moses, Miriam, and Aaron, they are what, they're, you know, they're Levites. They're priests. They're the ones who do, they're the ones in the, with, the, with the priesthood, the Levitical priesthood. You know, we know that, um, you know, we, we, they look after the temple. We know that they, they, they're responsive for the sacrifices and the offerings and, you know, the preparation of communion and things like that. Anyway, so that's the context. So this, are, this is an account of the gatekeepers. Who return? There's a branch of the Levites. Who are, you, know, you know the Levites don't have any inheritance. The Levites, in those days, they didn't take any job other than walking in the temple. They either worshipping or leading or doing one thing or the other. So when David said, I'd rather be a gatekeeper, what he was saying is that I would rather hang out with the sons of Korah. Anyway, the gatekeepers who returned, who returned were Shalom, Hakub, Simon, Hahiman, and the relatives. Shalom was the chief gatekeeper. 
prior to this time, they were responsible for the king's gate. Prior to this time, they were responsible for the king's gate on the east side. These men served as gatekeepers for the camps of the Levites. Shalom was the son of Korah, a descendant of Abiasa from the clan of Korah. You see that? From the, from, the, from the descendants of Korah. He and his relatives, the Korahites, were responsible for guarding the entrance of the sanctuary, just as their ancestors had guarded the tabernacle in the camp of the Lord. They were responsible just as their ancestors had guarded the tabernacle in the camp of the Lord. Phineas, son of Eleazar, had been in charge of the gatekeepers in earlier times, and the Lord had been with him. And later, Zechariah, son of Meshelmiah, was responsible for guarding the entrance to the tabernacle. In all, there were 212 gatekeepers in those days, and they were listed according to their genealogies in their villages. David and Samuel, the seer, now listen carefully, David, King David, and Samuel, the seer, had appointed their ancestors because they were reliable men. Another translation says, because they were trustworthy people. Another one says, because they could be dependent upon. Because they were reliable men. These gatekeepers and their descendants, by their divisions, were responsible for guarding the entrance to the house of the Lord. When that house was a tent. Now, they were, let's, let's pause there a little, a little moment. We know we are reading from the King James Version, right? So it's, I mean, sorry, we're reading from the Old Testament, right? It says they were responsible. Remember, it says their fathers were responsible for the, for the tent. That was, it's talking about when they were in the wilderness for the tent of meeting. Because that was placed outside the camp. They were the gatekeepers who prevented the people from going there or else they could have been destroyed. They were the ones who filtered, who was able to go in and who was able to come out. All right? He says now their fathers were also appointed. They are the sons of those ones, now their fathers. They were appointed to look after the place of worship they were, because their fathers were faithful. So it was considered that their sons also are faithful. So they considered that that family, that lineage, were faithful people, they trustworthy people, they were reliable people. So their sons also, who also by inheritance were Levites, were appointed to be gatekeepers of the temple because they also were appointed to guard the palace of the king because these people were faithful, committed, disciplined people. They were loyal people. He says, but he says, look, 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 look at it again. In verse number 23, it says, These gatekeepers and their descendants, by their divisions, were responsible for guarding the entrance of the house of the Lord when that house was a tent. There was a time when the house of the Lord was just a tent in, outside the camp. There was a time where it was a built up temple by, by, by you know, King Solomon, and that was pulled down, and another one was built, and both of them are pulled down now, right? And Jesus said to the Samaritan woman, What did Jesus say to her? He says, Either here, nor there. Either in this mountain, either the temple mount here, or the temple mount in your village, I, none of them will matter any longer. Because why? I'm the Savior Jesus. I am here. We will no longer need to worship that. We will need to worship in spirit, and we're going to worship what? In truth. And then Paul takes that a little bit further in Corinthians. He says, Do you not understand that you are the temple of God? He says, do you not know understand that your body is the temple of God? So you are a gatekeeper to your body. You're a gatekeeper to yourself. Now that the temple is you, now that you are the temple of God, you are a gatekeeper. You're a gatekeeper to yourself. He says, they watch the palace of the king. They watch the important places. They watch the place of worship. I am a gatekeeper in praise embassy. I have a responsibility to pray and pray and continue to pray when I thought I had prayed. And just stay in the place of intercession always to ensure that everyone who comes under the sound of my voice knows the heart of God. To ensure that none of them are missing. To ensure that on the last day everybody remains rapturable. That's part of my responsibility. But I ask you a question and I go back to where I started from this morning. Are you a gatekeeper in your home? Let's, let's talk to our parents this morning. Are you a gatekeeper in your family? Let's talk to the fathers. Are you a gatekeeper for your children? Let's talk to the mothers. Are you a gatekeeper? Are you a gatekeeper? I'm not saying, you know, choke your children and frustrate them. In fact, the Bible says, do not provoke your children into wrath. Don't, get, don't wind them up and get them angry. That's not what I'm saying. 
I'm, saying that, I'm not saying they don't have wisdom to make decisions. That's not what I'm saying. I'm not saying they shouldn't have liberty to, to do things. But there's a reason why you are in their lives. You are a steward to God in their behalf. You have a responsibility to help them make the right decisions. They will make their decisions, but they will, your responsibility is to ensure that they, are, they come to the right decision by putting them in the right, info, putting the right information in front of them, putting them in the right structure, helping them, sacrificing for them, being their gatekeeper, filtering through. Some of you don't even know your children's friends. They're always going out. I'm going out. Why don't you tell them to come home one day, cook for them? Say, bring all your friends, cook for them. And then watch them when they've eaten, especially boys. When they've eaten and they're playing, you watch them as they play and see the kind of things they talk about, the kind of things they do. And then use them as a basis of conversation. Not to, you, know, you don't need to be afraid or panic. Just have a conversation, a healthy, genuine, loving conversation with your children and understand why they're hanging out with those kind of people. And then you might educate, you may surprise that they will educate you. You would also educate them and, you, and they will realize why they shouldn't do certain things. It's not about placing rules. You mustn't do that. You mustn't do this. You don't go to school with them. They will do a thousand and over if you just force them. But if through love and respect and passion and dedication, you become gatekeepers into their life and you have genuine conversations with them, add to add conversation, teach them the word of God, show them what love truly means, show them what kindness really means. Don't be afraid to love their mother. Mothers, don't be afraid to show love to your husbands in front of your children because that's how they learn. If, they, if you keep it away and hide away to, to show yourself love, what will happen is they will think that there's no love in their home because they've never seen it demonstrated. You are the gatekeepers of their destiny, you know. You are the gatekeepers of their destiny. You have a responsibility to show them, to show them the right way. You have a responsibility to set them the examples. The school is not the gatekeeper to their destiny. The school may be the gatekeeper to their career, but it's not the gatekeeper to their destiny. Because what you become like a teacher and all of that does not define you. What you become like an engineer or doctor doesn't define you. What really defines you is your identity in Christ Jesus. I am a child of God. I am formed and made in the image and the likeness of God. It is being a child of God that really defines you because then the whole world is your oyster. Then the whole, you can do anything. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. I can do whatever I want to do because I know that I'm a child of God. The Bible says the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. So if God is my father, I can do anything. I can live anywhere. I can go any place because I have that confidence in me. Because I know that God is my father. But how would I know if nobody is my gatekeeper? If nobody's watching out for me when I'm vulnerable? Nobody's watching out for me when I'm not able to watch out for myself and there's nobody watching out for me? Are you watching out for the younger generation? Are we watching out for the generations to come? Are we giving opportunities to those who, who, who are young now so that they can express themselves, they can find their footing, so that they can bounce on, on, on the top of our successes and our failures? They can bounce and rise and they don't have to make those mistakes again. I once said to somebody who was much elder to me, and I said, and the, the person was sharing the story to me, and he says, oh, please, so, sorry that I'm burdening you with my story. And he said, I said, oh, no, 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 I'm not burdening at all. Thank you very much for sharing. She, I said, oh, good. I, he said, why? Why are you thanking me? I said, because then I don't have to make those mistakes again. Because you already made them. Why do I have to make them? He said, no, I want to, I want to make my own mistakes. Be careful. Not every mistake you want to make. Honestly, I, I get the fact that you want to make your own mistakes. And there's some mistakes that people should make. I get that. But a, that's another role of a gatekeeper. A gatekeeper would know what kind of mistakes you want to let people who are you are responsible for, what you want to allow them to make. There are kind of mistakes that you don't want to make because some of them, the physical impact of them is eternal. So as a gatekeeper, you want to, you're watching out. They, okay, I need to allow them to have some experience, but <laughs> this is going to destroy them. How many gatekeepers do we have in the house this morning? Because if you're a gatekeeper, you know that you have a responsibility. You know that you have to remain loyal and faithful. Faithful to your children, providing for them, keeping them. Faithful to the church, faithful to Jesus. Faithful, you know, your faithfulness just oozes out of you because that's what defines you. You just commit yourself. But because we must be careful. If there are no gatekeepers in society, we're gonna, we, things are going to run amok. Our families are going to be in trouble. Our churches will be in trouble. Our schools will be in trouble. Our communities will be in trouble. We need gatekeepers, people who can pray. We need gatekeepers, people who can say the truth. We need gatekeepers, people who can remain loyal and truthful. We need gatekeepers, people who will not be compromised. People who don't, who don't take bribes. We need gatekeepers in society. We need gatekeepers, those who can stand strong in the place of prayer. I was sharing with you the words of Queen Mary of Scotland last week. She was so afraid. She said, I'm, you know, I don't care about the Scottish army. I'm not afraid of the entire Scottish battalion. 
I, I'm not afraid of the entire Scottish army lining up against the palace. I am more afraid of John Knox going, to, going into his prayer room. I'm more afraid of John Knox going to his prayer room. I want to close out this sermon this morning by telling you two stories about two gatekeepers. One is in the Bible, one is not. One, I don't, the other one, I don't know if it's a fake story, if it's made up, if it's a tale or something. But it's about, the, I'll tell you that one first, about, about you know, a Burmese uh, fisherman. This fisherman, so the king announced that, oh, I'm going to have a big royal event and I want to make it a fish meal. A fish, you know, it's going to be served the best of fish. So the, 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 the palace people concluded and said, for us to have the best for the king, the fish ought to be caught that morning. You know, it's got to stay fresh. So they've got everything set up. There's decorations everywhere, all kinds of food, animals, everything being killed, being prepared. The whole place done up and everything is so royal and so powerful. They invited people from other kingdoms, all from all over the world, from China, from, from you know, all over, around the place, from Thailand, from Mali and Bali and all, you know, all royal people. People came in. It was magnificent. But the main cause is going to be fish meal. And this fisherman heard about the, the event. The, the, you know, and he says, but there's a big tide coming. Because he knew, he's a fisherman. He says, but there's a big tide coming. Anybody who risked their life to go to the sea that morning will lose their life. But then he heard that the king has all kinds of guests and everyone coming. So what does he do? He says, I'm going to risk it. I'm going to go. No fisherman went to fish that morning, but he went to fish. He had a big catch. He was, he was, luckily, he, was, he didn't die. He, because he, 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 he was worried about the reputation of the king, you know. So he drags his net. He gets to the front of the palace. And then he meets the gatekeeper in front of the palace. And the gatekeeper sees him and says, of all the people in this country, you're the one who has gone to take risk. You're trying to, you're trying to get favors with the king. You're trying to feel like a good boy. You know, you're trying to feel like, you know, who, who are you? You know, this and that. He said, now I'm going to punish you. I'm not going to let you in. So this fish is going to rotten at this gate. Then the man kept begging. He says, what if I shared 50%? What if I share 50% of my reward with you? He says, oh, okay, now, yeah, okay. I can consider that. You see, this is why I say gatekeepers must be honest. So he goes and lets the man in. The man goes, and the king was very angry with the man. He says, why are you so late? This and that. You know, I thought, you know, we we're not going to have to say, oh, there was going to be a tie, this and that. He said the whole story. The king lets him. The king, the king lets him in. He goes in, and they served the fish. They cooked it. It was the best meal ever. The fish was fresh, amazing. The old countries, everybody was celebrating. This king, oh, is the best host in the world and all of that. And then as he was about to leave, the king says, what do I reward you with? He said, oh, king, reward me with 100 lashes. He says, reward me with 100 lashes of the cane. Amen, somebody. You people are very good with mathematics. <laughs> So the king lashes, the king was reluctant and the king said to his servant, he said, please just pretend like you're beating him. Don't beat him hard. He's been the savior of the day. You know, he's been a good guy. Just flog him very carefully. Don't, don't make it hot. As they got to 49, bam, 50. Of course, he wasn't hurting because they didn't really flog him properly. They just made it up. So because the king, you know, the word of king is power. You have to fulfill it. He says, I will give you anything you ask for. So he had to do it. But they didn't really flog him properly. So he says, why did you ask? He says, stop. He says, I've taken fifth half of it. I promised the gate man, I promised the gatekeeper at the gate that I will give him half of whatever you have promised me. So, he says, why? He says, because, he said, if I don't give him half of it, I can't bring in the fish. And the fish was going to rot in and he would not be able to have a good festival and all of that. The king was angry. And he calls his servant. He said, did I tell you before not to flog this other man? This, other, this gatekeeper, I want you to double the effort. I want you to, in fact, I want you to get some of your colleagues together, grab him and tie him down and flog him properly. What kind of gatekeeper are you? I'm going to stop them. Like our time is gone. I'll have told you about Mordecai as well, but you know, you can read that up in the book of Esther. But at the end of the day, similar stuff. Mordecai was at the gate and in the end, because he was always at the gate, the king saw him one day and remembered, what have we done for this guy who did a very marvelous thing for us? and preserve the life of the king. And Mordecai got, became royal from that day. He was blessed and he was celebrated. Please rise to your feet as we pray. I want you to practice gatekeeping this morning. <laughs> <laughs>